Greetings, welcome to neck pain, arm pain. What is it? This is the same talk I gave during COVID-7, so hopefully it'll be familiar with those of you who've been med students for you know the, all the most recent uh, COVIDs. Um, the objectives of this talk, understand shoulder anatomy and indications for a total and reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, um, understand the anatomic basis for different neck, shoulder, and arm conditions, understand the typical presentation of neck, shoulder, and arm conditions, and understand a little bit um, the purpose and interpretation of diagnostic studies, but that'll be more for the group sessions because we'll go over cases that will hopefully emphasize some of the points from this very quick, brief lecture. Um, and again, same thing with differential diagnosis. We'll get into more of that when we do the, uh, the group sessions to talk about some actual clinical cases. This talk, really, it's more about, um, you know, I mean, the, it, the neck and shoulder, I just use it as an example because, you know, the neck and, and shoulder are really the uh, low back and, and hip of the neck and shoulder. Um, don't think about that too hard. The point is that this kind of gives your window into things you're going to always have to think about um, when we have a patient in front of you who has pain, whether you're a pediatrician, um, internal medicine, family medicine, rehab, orthopedics, you know, whatever you go into, you're going to have patients who have musculoskeletal problems, and this helps will help you kind of understand the difference between diagnosing and treating neurogenic pain versus mechanical pain um, and everything in between. So um, the shoulder joint is a weird joint and shoulders are always compared to hips. So if you have an operation that takes place in the hip, I promise you within 10 or 15 years, we'll design a similar operation for the shoulder. However, the analogy is not perfect because the hip really has a lot of bony stability. The hip really is a ball in a cup. Um, and so even without all the soft tissue structures holding it in place, the femoral head is covered very well by the acetabulum, unless the acetabulum is dysplastic. Um, the shoulder is more like a golf ball on a golf tee. So this is, so as you know, this is a golf ball, this is a golf tee. Um, it's a giant ball on a tiny socket. There are things that kind of hold, that help hold it on there. There's the labrum, which is a rim of tissue, which attaches to the um, edges of the socket. And that, that helped provide depth to the socket because the bony socket is, is, is very small. There's also the rotator cuff, which are four muscles that come from the scapula and insert around the humeral head on the greater and lesser tuberosities. The subscapularis comes from the undersurface of the scapula and inserts on the lesser tuberosity. Supraspinatus comes across the top and the infraspinatus and teres minor come from the posterior inferior part of the scapula and their job is to hold the humeral head on the center of the glenoid and help initiate certain things. The supraspinatus can help initiate elevation. Subscapularis gives you internal rotation. The infraspinatus and teres minor are more important for external rotation. The teres minor stabilizes your arm in external rotation and elevation. So like the horn blower sign, if you can't hold your arm like this, it means your teres minor is not working. Um, so the, in other words, the shoulder is very, very dependent on surrounding soft, t soft tissues for stability. This goes just to show you again, just what we just talked about. This is a front view of the shoulders. Here's the coracoid, here's the clavicle. This is subscapularis inserting on the lesser tuberosity. The biceps is not in this picture, but it would be the long head goes through the bicipital groove. This is a posterior look at the shoulder. Here's the supraspinatus coming out under the acromion and inserting in the greater tuberosity. Then the posterior view, this is the infraspinatus and the teres minor. Beware of anatomy books that aren't totally accurate. The infraspinatus actually has two heads. So there's a little fat stripe here, which is an important landmark surgically because you have to remember that and not think that you're between the infraspinatus and the teres minor when you're not. Because if you make an incision here, you denervate the entire inferior portion of the infraspinatus. So if you're doing like a, operating on a scapular fracture, you want to be between the teres minor and the infraspinatus because that is known as an internervous plane, which is really um, important in surgery, not because it makes us nervous, but because it's two different nerves. So the teres minor gets its um, nerve supply or its innervation from the axillary nerve and the infraspinatus gets its supply from the suprascapular nerve as does the supraspinatus. So if you're operating between two nerves, you can expose the bone without injuring either nerve and without denervating either muscle.
Um, bony anatomy of the shoulder, uh, quick ana anatomy summary. Here is the clavicle, here is the acromion. These are the conoid and trapezoid ligaments. We're not gonna get tested. This, I won't test you in that kind of granular way. You probably had that already for gross. The acromioclavicular uh, capsule. And then you have basically um, the glenohumeral ligaments. Um, a lot of variation in the um, anatomy of glenohumeral ligaments, which again, won't really be important unless you become a shoulder surgeon. Uh, and then the you know, coracohumeral, which are just some fibers which kind of go in the interval between the subscapularis and the supraspinatus at the area that we refer to as the anterior rotator interval. Again, not testable stuff. Um, there are two types of shoulder arthritis, um, basically. Um, and again, kind of broad categories because I'm not talking about like inflammatory arthritis and degenerative arthritis. I'm just talking about two different kinds of shoulder arthritis. There's one where the cuff is totally intact, soft tissues are fine, and the bearing wears out. So in this case, the humeral head is well centered on the glenoid, but the cartilage is worn. And this is the big bone spur here, which has developed. There's a little bone spur on the glenoid side. So it, the reason bone spurs occur, as the cartilage gets thinner, the bone gets exposed to more force. Its response to that is to do two things. Increase its surface area, which the bone spurs do, and also decrease the motion of the shoulder. The primary thing that gets decreased in shoulders is rotation. And so it's kind of your body's way of internally splinting a joint with damaged cartilage by forming these big bone spurs to disperse the force and stabilize the joint. That, that's your body's response to it, which sometimes actually is fairly effective. Oftentimes it's not super effective. Um, now, this bottom one is the second one. This is when the cuff is not intact. And so what happens is you have failure of the rotator cuff, and in some people this leads to, you, you, you've lost the centering force of the cuff, so the humeral head migrates proximally and wears into the acromion. So the, the undersurface of the acromion takes on the same shape of the humeral head, and actually this process is referred to acetabularization of the shoulder joint because it becomes more like a hip, because then the glenoid and the acromion sort of form this bigger socket to contain the humeral head. This condition is known as a rotator cuff arthropathy, and that is, it's a, it's a joint process that has developed because the rotator cuff is not intact. So these are the two different kinds of shoulder arthrosis. And again, for, we're not talking about the concept of like inflammatory versus degenerative arthritis. We're just talking about, because you can actually have components of, of, of both in these, but for the, this is just the purpose of talking about the function of the cuff and whether you have arthritis with cuff intact and the joint wearing out with the cuff not intact. So the top one is primary glenohumeral arthrosis and the bottom one is a rotator cuff arthropathy. So they have different answers. So if the cuff is fine and your body is capable of holding the humeral head on the center of the glenoid, then you just have to replace the bearing surfaces, cut out the bone spurs and replace the bearing surfaces. So in this case, basically put a stem in the middle of the bone, a little metal cap, um, the socket's made out of plastic, looks something like that, and so, you, it's, so it's radio um, lucent, so you don't see it, but it's there. You can, if you look carefully, you can see little pegs outlined in bone cement to kind of hold that in place. That's what these pegs are. Again, it's not glue, it's just an interference fit. So you're injecting this stuff called uh, polymethyl methacrylate, which is the same thing that's in Corian countertops. Um, and it just squeezes itself around the pegs to stabilize the implant. Now we also have little metal, which will encourage bony ingrowth. Um, either way, that's um, the socket's made out of plastic, whether or not it's got any kind of metal in it to encourage the bone to grow around it. But this is how you replace a shoulder in someone who has an intact rotator cuff. If their cuff is not intact, it won't work because then the ball will ride eccentrically on the socket and if it's eccentric, it will kind of load along the edge of that plastic socket and cause it to wear out. Um, this is what we do um, when the cuff is not intact. Ironically, the first shoulder replacement ever was put in in the um, late 18, or well, actually late 1800s, um, around uh, 1892 or 93 in France, and it was made out of platinum and leather, and it was a reverse shoulder replacement um, put in by someone named Payenne, who uh, was a very famous surgeon in those days. He's actually depicted, I think, in the Louvre in a, in a painting by uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, but I digress. So here is the, um, a big ball 
So you're converting the shoulder into a ball and socket joint. And there's a little, what you can't see is the plastic liner, which you can see here. So you're taking the shoulder and you're kind of making it more like a backwards hip. So you're restoring bony stability because, because the cuff isn't there to center the humerus on the glenoid, you are designing a prosthesis which maintains a center of rotation. So this has a pretty fixed center of rotation because it, it conforms to the ball much more and then it allows your big muscles like the deltoid and the pec and the lat to move the shoulder and your prosthesis is providing the internal stability. This um, ironically or maybe not ironically was invented in France in the kind of 1980s, 1990s by someone named Gramont and that, that ushered in a, an entirely new era of shoulder surgery because we did not have a good answer for people who had, who had shoulder arthritis and a non-functional rotator cuff and this restores function in people like that um, to an unbelievable degree to the point where this only became legal to put it in, in the United States in 2003 that's when the FDA approval went through, and it, now it is the predominant type of shoulder replacement done in the United States. So in a short, like less than 20 years since it came out, more of these are put in than any other type of shoulder replacement. Um, so shoulder origin pain. And again, part of the purpose of the talk is to teach you about shoulders is to, to understand the difference between mechanical joint pain and neurogenic pain, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, shoulder origin pain, pain originating from the shoulder joint itself, is generally mechanical in nature. It localizes to the glenohumeral joint and lateral deltoid, and is exacerbated by shoulder range of motion testing. It's often associated with a loss of glenohumeral motion, particularly when you get a lot of osteophytes, um, the shoulder loses its ability to rotate and it can temporar temporarily be relieved by a shoulder injection. So if you're trying to decide, well, is this coming from the neck or coming from the shoulder, that's when therapeutic injections come into play and diagnostic injections. So if I'm not sure, because people can have pathology in the neck and pathology in the shoulder, if I inject the shoulder and their pain goes away, I can kind of assume that a lot of their pain is coming from the shoulder. Um, Cervicogenic pain is different. It can be mechanical and or neurologic. If you have degenerative disease in your cervical spine, you can have mechanical pain from having you know, worn out joints and arthritic joints in, in, in your neck. Um, and mechanical pain is generally reproduced with cervical motion and also by palpating the uh, painful areas. Um, people often come in complaining of shoulder pain, but it's different. So if someone's complaining of pain here, like in the lateral neck, or in the medial border of the scapula, that generally is not coming from the shoulder joint. When people have shoulder pain, they're generally talking about pain here and pain here, and that's a really important way to make a distinction. Also, if someone has primarily shoulder disease, they shouldn't really have any abnormal neurologic findings. And this gets into the same kind of myelopathy versus radiculopathy that I, I talked about in the back pain lecture, um, or we'll talk about it if you haven't watched it yet. Um, my, and this is an important testable concept. Myelopathy is caused by spinal cord compression. In the case of the neck, usually by something, often a disc, pressing on the spinal cord. It's non-dermatomal, it's not a nerve root, it's the spinal cord. These patients tend to be hyperreflexic. They often have symptoms like loss of balance, um, loss of fine motor skills and positive long track signs. Like a Babinski sign might be positive in someone with spinal cord compression. Other signs of like upper motor neuron disease, like if you flick a finger like that and cause the other fingers to flex, that's a Hoffman sign. That's a long track sign. Those are present in patients who have myelopathy. So hyperreflexic, it's not distributed in nerve root distribution, and it can have other symptoms that, that tell you it's more of a spinal cord um, problem. Um, radiculopathy um, also can happen from a disc. Now myelopathy happens if you have a disc pressing on the cord, but if a disc is extruded to the side where it's not hitting the cord but hitting a nerve root, that causes entirely different symptoms. The distribution of numbness is dermatomal because you're pressing on usually a single nerve root. The weakness is specific to that nerve root. Like if you have a C7 nerve root compressed, you lose your triceps reflex. Um, and these patients tend to be hyporeflexic and not spastic. So this is a really important concept in distinguishing between mechanical pain and neurologic pain, and also making a distinction between myelopathy and radiculopathy.
Um, the other thing we talked about a little bit in, in the, um, you know, whether something's back pain or, or something else, um, neuropathy. Neuropathy is when you have a compression of a nerve. I talk about carpal tunnel in different lectures, so I'm not going to belabor it here, but only bring it up again to kind of emphasize that the neurologic findings tell you kind of where it's coming from. If your findings are along just a, a single nerve root, like a dermatome, and only things innervated by that root, and, and you're numb in that, in that distribution, then it's probably a nerve root compression. If, you have, if you're having symptoms like, you know, in carpal tunnel, the median nerve is made up of multiple nerve roots. I'm not going to get into brachial plexus anatomy, but they're going to have basically findings in the distribution of the nerve that is compressed. In the case of the median nerve, they'll have numbness in the thumb, index, middle, half of the ring, thenar weakness. So your knowledge of anatomy um, can help you understand the difference between myelopathy, radiculopathy, and neuropathy. And we'll show some cases um, also to emphasize this. And I think that is about it for this topic.